and leave it to contrarian badass Reggie Middleton. Now, at the time, you were the only analyst in the world to mention that it would starve the banks. Reggie Middleton, who nailed Facebook, by the way. I mean, not to be impolite, but what makes you so special that they all want to read your blog? Um, I can step on toes and be objective, objective and uh, offensively honest. Greetings. This is Reggie Middleton, and this is a video to accompany my blog post um, entitled The Future of Money, Part 1. So, the reason why I'm doing this is to give a background for my entrepreneurial pursuits and my investment perspective on the new age of currencies, that is cryptographic and digital currencies, and how they relate to the world today. It is my belief that the digital currencies or the cryptographic currencies are so woefully misunderstood that uh, their place in things cannot be um, ad ad adequately calculated or perceived. And so, of course, um, those who have a large following, such as um, economists, Paul Krugman, policymakers, politicians, and practitioners, both on the banking side and service provider side and on the investment and savings side, actually know what this stuff is about. Um, what is money? Well, according to Wikipedia, money, or let's not do technical definitions, let's make this uh, plain and simple grassroots perspective. Money is something that could be used as a store of value or something that can exchange said value. In other words, um, if you go to purchase a camera, money, a medium of exchange, will be used to purchase that camera. The reason you can use money or the reason why money is preferable over a direct barter system is that if I had a chicken bone and someone else had a camera and I needed a camera and that person needed a chicken bone, we are the only ones that we can actually, these two parties, myself and the person with the camera, are the only ones who can complete this transaction because I need a camera. He needs a chicken bone. With a medium of exchange, I can take currency, I can take money, and I can exchange that my chicken bone for money and then wait until I find somebody with a camera. That's a deferred exchange. That has value, that has economic value and utility value. With a direct border system, I need to look around and wait till I find somebody with a camera. That per camera who wants a chicken bone has to look around for someone who wants a chicken bone. And then we have to negotiate value, price, how many bones for the camera, how many cameras for a bone, etc. So money is something that serves as a store of value, relatively stable store of value, uh, a medium of exchange, and uh, something that can pass for deferred exchange. Now, there are conditions for each of these. For instance, uh, in order to be a medium of exchange, it is alleged that you have to have a stable value. The US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. It's the deepest, widest, most liquid of the currency markets. Is the US dollar truly a stable store of value? You know, go past the 100. If you take a look at the past 100 years and compare the US dollar, to any necessary and consumable commodity. If you compare it to gold, which you know I don't re actually recommend because gold is not truly consumable, um, but it does have a relatively stable store of value as compared to dollar. Or if you uh, compare the dollar to what, any other commodity that is needed, such as energy, fuel, oil, um, food, housing, the dollar has not been stable at all. And you can see it drops precipitously over the 100 years. So. It looks like there may be some falsehood, uh, incongruity, or error in that definition because the dollar is widely accepted as currency, yet it is not. So another aspect of money is transferability. Basically, the ability to move money. Right now, using dumb money, transferability is moderately difficult. It's easy to transfer a small amount of dumb money. Uh, especially in its physical form. You take a quarter, a penny, a nickel, a dollar, five dollars, ten, fifteen, twenty, even a couple of hundred dollars, you know, and transfer it in a very small amount like that. As you scale up to larger amounts of money, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, that smugglers can of course attest to, it's very difficult to transfer it. 
you need briefcases, you hide it in body cavities, and that's for illegal means. But even for legal means, it's very difficult to transfer it, particularly transferring it safely. Of course, in this day and age, physical money has been transferred into digital money, ones and zeros. That's most of the stuff that you actually have in banks. You know, banks do very little business in actual physical dollars, mostly businesses done in digital dollars. But still, transferability is hampered by the dumb money history of digital money. Digital money was based upon physical money, which was dumb, and even though it's become digital, it still retains its dumb money characteristics and ideals. So, the, and the, excuse the pun, but the dumbest part of the dumb money, or the dumbest idea of dumb money, is the need, the necessity for an intermediary for you to handle or access your own money. That is a dumb money characteristic from the days when money was dumb due to technological, uh, the lack of technological advances. Today, it's dumb simply because it's a dumb idea. There is no need to use a bank to access money, to send money to somewhere else, or a financial intermediary that will take, you know, three, four, five percent of your money. You know, hello, retail merchants, when you can do so through a P2P network, a peer-to-peer -peer network, at almost a cost-free basis, or near cost-free basis, near frictionless basis, 24 hours a day, you don't have to adhere to banking holidays, banking hours, etc. And again, fees are out the window, um, or at least exorbitant fees are out the window. That makes transferability an issue. Um, now, the US dollar and the US banking system, the European, the euro, and the European bank system are still considered pillars of uh, capitalism. It's still considered foundations of money. But the actual definition of money itself um, includes and incurs transferability. So, using cryptographic currency, we use Bitcoin as a nominal example. In my previous video, I made an analogy of Bitcoin um, being a car. And it's a car that many say is all overvalued or is in a, in a bubble because of a rapid increase in price. But imagine if that car was able, it came with its own international global highway that allowed you to drive anywhere there was an internet connection, including overseas, any country. And at the same time, that car was able to avoid all toll roads, all paid bridges, anything that included a price. And in addition, that toll, that road, that international roadway that only this car can travel on was able to power that car at zero cost. So you didn't have to pay for fuel, you didn't have to pay for toll, you didn't have geographic restrictions except for internet access. You could basically go anywhere you want, anytime you want. Now, would that car be of more value than the car that you have to go and lease, rent, or buy a road to travel? And then as you travel that road, you pay for a toll everywhere you go. And then that road is then cut off at every geographic boundary. You know, whether it be country or every physical or socio-political or even sometimes socio-economic boundary or geopolitical boundary. That car is hampered in many different ways. It's hampered from a um, chronological perspective. You know, you can only drive that car between banking hours of, say, um, 7 and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday not Christmas, not uh, New Year's, etc. So now you see a big difference in the value of these cars. You know, car number two or car number one is Bitcoin and Bitcoin's inherent transmission network. Car number two is the dumb dollar. Now digitized, now more capable, but still not very capable because it's based on the dumb dollar's foundation or the dumb currency's foundation. Let's not pick on just the dollar.